Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to our online service for this week. Um, it's unfortunate that we can't be in each other's presence and, and worshipping together in the flesh this week, but uh, we do what we can with what we have. Um, and so this morning we are grateful that we are able to actually um, have something and that we're able to uh, share the word with you and that you are able to receive the word even while we are not able to be together. Um, Seeing as this is sort of out of our um, regular pattern of weekly services, uh, we won't be continuing as we have in the English services with uh, our journey through 1 Samuel chapter 17. Uh, This week we're going to be jumping into 1 Peter, but we will be back in 1 Samuel um, 17 once we're back in person again. Uh, But for this week we are going into um, 1 Peter and we're going to be looking at chapter 1 verse 22 to chapter 2 verse 3. So if you have your Bibles with you if you're, while you're watching this, um, you can grab out your Bible and you can read along with me on there. Uh, but before we get into the Word, let me pray for us. Lord, I thank you for your glorious Word which you have given us. This truth for the ages that you have graciously given your people. Lord, we pray that you may be with us as we look at your Word. That every word we may count as holy and from our God. Lord, I pray that you may open the hearts of your people. You may sharpen their minds so that the word may take root in their hearts. Lord, I pray for myself. In this moment, as we come to the word, I pray that you, through your spirit, may keep me faithful to your text. And that you may proclaim to your people what you want them to hear this morning. And I ask this in Jesus' mighty name. To him be the glory. Amen. Uh, so as I said this morning, we're in First Peter, and we're going to be looking at verses uh, 22 in chapter 1 to verse 3 in chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, please uh, open it up and follow along with me. I'm reading from the ESV, um, but follow along and we will get into the, um, into the message in a minute. From verse 22. Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sin... Having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly for a, from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory is like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news. That was proclaimed, what that was preached to you. So put away all malice, all deceit, and hypocrisy, and envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. This is the word of the Lord. So this morning, if we are looking at this text, if you pick up this text and you've spent some time reading Paul, you've been reading Ephesians, you've been reading Galatians, uh, and you've read where Paul says, you are saved by grace through faith alone, and this is not of your own doing, but it is a gift of God. And now you come to Peter, and Peter is saying, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. You're asking some questions. Didn't Paul just say that we are purified? By grace, through faith. That we are saved by grace, through faith. And here Peter is telling us that we have to purify our own souls through obedience. What's going on here? Are Peter and Paul contradicting one another? Is Peter saying you need to be obedient so your soul may be purified? Is Paul saying that you are purified by Christ alone? Are they in conflict? Well, we're going to be looking at that. So as we look at verses, uh, let's just jump into verse 22 and look at this. So having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth. What the statement means, I think, hinges very, very much on what Peter means by the truth. What is this truth Peter is referring to? And how is one obedient to that truth? Well, if we look at this context and you look closely enough, Peter is speaking here of the truth as the gospel. The truth that Peter is referring to is the gospel. But then what does obedience to the gospel look like? How are we obedient to this truth? In short, 
The gospel is this, that we are unable to save ourselves. Because of the fall, we have all fallen into sin. We are all incapable of doing what is necessary for us to be in relationship, restored to relationship with a holy God. But apart from us, despite us, while we were still sinners, God sends his son, Jesus. Jesus, God in flesh, dies on the cross for people who are unable to save themselves, who are undeserving to, say, undeserving to be saved or in relationship with God. So how and through what he has done, he has reconciled us apart from us, despite us, with God. That is the gospel message. And if Peter is saying that we are purified through our obedience to this truth, that is something radically different to earning it. Obedience to the gospel is not a set of rules and laws that you obey, because the gospel is not a set of rules and laws. The gospel is by its very definition, by the very word that is used for it, it is good news. Good news is not laws. Good news is a proclamation of what has been done, not what you need to do. So then obedience to this truth, obedience to the gospel is not living out a set of rules, but it is living in line with a truth. It is living in line with a reality of what has been done. See, if the gospel is that Jesus has saved you by his grace, then to be obedient to that is to say, I realize this. To be obedient to that is to come to the realization that you have no hope within yourself. To come to the realization that he is your only hope. To fall on him for mercy. To be obedient to the gospel is to come to the end of yourself and trust in Jesus who is able and willing to save. And there are multiple ways in which this purifies us. You can see in your own life, and I can see in my life, practical ways in which obedience to this truth, in which living in line with this truth of the gospel, purifies our souls. Number one, it kills pride. To live in line with the truth that I have been saved apart from myself, despite myself, while I was not deserving, is devastating to pride. Because I am unable in myself to do what is necessary to save myself. I am unable to do for my wife or for those who I love most what is necessary to give them what they need most. That is devastating to my pride. But at the same time, it is so uplifting. Knowing that I am loved accepted not because of who i am despite who i am what great love that is to us and how devastating to pride how much more of an encouragement do we need to live a humble life than knowing that and the second is when i look at what christ has done for me when we look at what jesus has done we are in some way obligated we feel this pressure like how can i live a life with a clenched fist Knowing that he has done this for me. If I look at Jesus who dies for me, who gives all for me, when I deserve none of it, how can I walk by someone in need with a clenched fist, unwilling to give, unwilling to help, cold-hearted, indifferent? That, that is a difficult thing. And I think we all struggle with it in one way or another. Um, it is not easy to live as generously as we ought all the time. But because of what we have seen in Jesus and what he has done for us, there is a certain inconsistency in us to not live that way. Apart from Jesus, I don't see any inconsistency in that. To the one who gives and is generous but has no faith in Christ, they do it not because of any obligation or that. They don't do it out of any sort of real basis. It's nice and all, but they have no basis for why. But as Christians, we have some obligation. It's hard to explain how it works in a sense, but if we think about it, because of what he has done for us, we cannot live a life inconsistent with that than relating to others. As we move on to the rest of verse 22, 
have pur having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere so having beginning verse 22 having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth and then there is a four whenever you see a four in the bible you need to ask what is the four therefore you need to ask what is the four therefore why is that four there having purified your souls by obedience to the truth that four is for a purpose we have been we have obedience to the truth we have purified our souls for this purpose for a sincere brotherly love love one another earnestly from a pure heart we are made pure to love one another well the gospel changes us on the inside for one one of the purposes of that is that we are able in our community to love one another with a brotherly love with a real love to love one another well that we live on the margins of society See, as we've uh, looked at this book before, I've explained that the people who Peter, are, who Peter is writing to here are people who are living on the margins of their society. People who are living very much in a similar circumstance as we are today. As Christians, they were no longer part of the in-group in their society. They were no longer part of the general culture. They were outsiders. They were weirdos. They were unaccepted by the people they lived amongst. Their views, their beliefs were mocked shunned by the people who they lived with and lived among and see many of these people would have faced a, a, a very grim reality they would have been part of their family worshipping their family's gods but now they come into um, they come and they are changed by Jesus and no matter what they cannot not believe in him they have seen they have tasted and seen that the Lord is good and they can do no other but that brings them into conflict with the foundational beliefs of the people who they love most. And these people cannot accept them. These people cast them out. They are chased out of families. They are shunned. They are disowned. And this reality is not only... This, this, this what happened to these people who Peter is writing to is not only a reality 2,000 years ago, but to a reality for many of our brothers and sisters in Christ who live across this planet. Through a few trips to Cambodia, I've met many people, many young people particularly, who have been uh, chased out of their house, whose family will not accept them, whose family will not speak to them, because they have forsaken their previous religions, they have forsaken their previous way of life because they cannot live that way of life and believe in Jesus at the same time. I've seen young people in tears, wishing and hoping that their parents would come to faith, that people who they love so very much would at least talk to them again. And that's the reality to which Peter is writing here. And that's why we see this idea of brotherly love. It's familial love, like family love, which he is speaking about here. Because the church has now become their new family. The church is the family for those who are on the outskirts of society, who have been shunned by their other earthly families. And that is also an instruction for us on how we ought to be as a church. We are a family, a community with common ground, with a new identity that is uniting us. We may not have the same blood, we may not all be related in the same parents, but we are united in love around a solid truth, around this imperishable seed which Peter speaks about, the gospel. You have been brought into and united to a new community by the word of God. Again here referring to the gospel. We are not a separate entities. We are not individuals who love Jesus separately. But we have been called into community. And now even for those who have lost their earthly families because they will not accept them as they believe in Christ. We have a new family. With a solid rock. A thing which holds us together even tighter than blood ties. A common faith in the gospel. A new identity in Jesus. And as this word, this gospel, and this word, this gospel, is what it is all about. 
It is what the whole church experiences. It is what Christianity is about. It is the center, the foundation of all that we do as a church. It is the center of our new identity. It is the center around which we as Christians relate. It is upon the gospel and the gospel alone that we are able be, to be united to people who are different to us, who we would not necessarily be associated with. But through our common faith in Jesus and what he has done for us and how he has changed us, we are united in the gospel. And Peter goes on to speak about this, this word of God. He's comparing this idea of perishable and not, not peri imperishable and perishable. So we have not been born of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all, fre all flesh is like la all, <laughs> that's a tongue twister. All flesh is like grass, and all is glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the good news that was preached to you. This word. This word of the Lord, again, the gospel, Peter referring to here, the good news of what Jesus has done will endure forever. And so the reality is, if we build a church around anything other than this truth, this word of the Lord that endures forever, that church will fade and fall and become nothing. And not only church, anything in the world, that is built on anything other than the word of God that endures forever will fade, it will fail, it will pass, it will come to nothing in the end. Go back to the church. Imagine the church as a solar system. In the center of our solar system sits the sun. And the sun's gravitational pull holds all these planets which spin around it together. But say we will take the sun away. And put in its place Earth, or put in its place Mercury, what would happen? All these other li little bits will go flying off into space and flying into one another, and the result would be desolation and destruction. In the same way, if we put anything other than the gospel at the center of the solar system of our churches, of our church, everything else will be flying off into space, falling apart. Resulting in destruction, desolation. And you see this very often. Churches who put pastors and leaders at the center and build their congregations on the backs of a single person. If we build our churches around a person and that person fails, the whole thing falls apart. Churches are often built around cultural relevance. They are more about getting people in the door and getting people to stay than proclaiming the truth of the gospel. But culture changes. People who were relevant 10 years ago are cancelled on Twitter today. So if we build the church on cultural, on cultural relevance, things are going to fly off and it is going to fail and it is going to fade. And it's not going to make a difference in this world. And I think the one that we as a church, as Lukmundi, can be most guilty of is building our community around cultural heritage. Our cultural heritage may come and go and it will change, but if that is the center of our community, it is bound to fail. We must put the gospel at the center. Above all else, as most important, as preeminent. See, the common object of love between us is the gospel. If our community is centered around anything other than the gospel of Jesus, it will fall apart. So if our church is centered around being South African, we are bound to fail. Our cultures, our traditions, like us, are like grass. They will fade, they will change, they will wither, but the gospel will remain forever. Our common object of love cannot be a culture or a language, but that will change. But if the center of our love, our connection with one another, is the gospel of Jesus, we have placed it then on something that will not change. It will not fade. And it will remain forever. Because the God who is sovereign over history has said so. 
It is a solid foundation on which to build a community. A community that will last and stand the test of time. A community that will properly show forth the glory of our God. That's what we are in the business of, aren't we? We're not in the business of giving great people a great platform. We're not in the business of being culturally relevant for the sake of being culturally relevant. We want to be relevant to the culture as much as we possibly can without changing the gospel. But if the gospel is not the center, that will fail. We're not in the business of preserving a culture or a language, but we are in the business of seeing the good news of what Jesus has done for sinners like us, proclaimed to the world. So not only ought we to be centered around the gospel, but our congregations and our congregational life ought to be saturated with the gospel. We ought to live lives with one another that aren't just about the rugby on the weekend or biltong or all these other good things. But our lives ought to be saturated with the gospel in such a way that it is not a strange thing to speak about it. That it is not an awkward thing to have a conversation about theology. That is not a weird thing to bring up at dinner. But that the gospel, that the Bible, the theology, that the church may be normal conversation. May be normal among us. We are not all to be focused on the gospel. We ought to have our lives saturated by the gospel. Moving on then to chapter 2 verse 1. So then. Put away malice, all malice, all deceit, all hypocrisy, all envy, and all slander. Peter is saying, now since you have been brought into this new community, now that your hearts have been made pure through obedience to the gospel, coming to the end of yourself and trusting in Jesus, you ought to embody this message. You cannot do it because <laughs> you ought to embody this message. There are things which are not in line with this. This new community is to embody the message that at its core there are things it cannot do because it is in conflict with the gospel which it is centered around. Malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, slander. These things are not in line with the gospel. So they cannot be part of this new community that God is creating, this church. Note again. And make sure that you understand this. Peter is not making a list of things here that if you do them, you are not able to get into the community. This is not a list of things that says, if you aren't malicious, if you aren't deceitful, if you aren't a hypocrite, if you aren't envious, if you aren't slanderous, then you can get in. Paul is writing to those who are in already. He is referring to the church as a, as a family, as a household. The picture that we see here is adoption. We have been adopted into a new family. And having graciously been adopted into this family, out of love and appreciation of the Father who has brought us into his family, we now live in obedience to the rules he has given us. He didn't say, do this, 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 and this, and then I will adopt you. And that's not how it works in the real world either. Children are adopted into a household, and once they become part of that household, they are to follow the rules of that household. Now, as ones who have been adopted by God, brought into his family, given a seat at his table, there is a way that we live out of gratitude for him and what he has done for us. A way of living that is in line with the rules of the house which we have been welcomed into. And rules, those rules are in line with the gospel. We are not to be malicious because Christ was not malicious to us. We are not to be malicious because the God who saves us is not deceitful. We are not to be deceitful because the God who saves us is not deceitful. We are not to be hypocrites. But we often can be. And thank God that we are not kicked out if we are one of these things. But that we are graciously, through the Spirit, prompted to not be so. But we are not to be hypocrites because we serve the God of truth. And we are to live in line with that truth. We are not to be envious or slander one another. 
because we are all sinners saved by grace. What does anyone have that has not been given to them by God? And what do you have that you have not been given undeservedly? To slander another is to forget the darkness which you have been brought out of. How can I slander a brother in Christ or anyone else, having seen the darkness which is in me? And finally, we get to verse 2 and verse 3. Peter exhorts, encourages these people. Like newborn infants, long for pure spiritual milk, that it may, that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Other places in the Bible where, where Paul is writing is referring to milk. He, he is referring it to it in a negative way, in the sense of saying that you are still drinking milk. You ought to be more mature than this. But Peter is not trying to say that you are drinking spiritual milk because you are infant. But he is saying that this spiritual milk is something you ought to long for. Peter is using milk as a, a, a completely sort of different analogy than Paul would be when he is referring to it. The milk here is a good thing. As newborn children long for milk, we as Christians ought to long for this pure spiritual milk. Again, the gospel. Peter is referring to the gospel. And it ought to be something which we long for and we need throughout our Christian life. I think a confusing thing which we often do is that we think that the gospel, that's Christian ABCs. Like that's what you get started with. And once you've got the gospel under facts, then you get to real Christianity. That's when you get to big boy Christianity. But that is not the case. The gospel is the beginning, the end, and everything in between. The gospel is not just the message that converts you. The gospel is for all believers over all time, from when you are first born into this new family to when you are 50 years in the family. The gospel is for all from beginning to end. Simple enough that you can understand it, no matter who you are or where you are or what sort of level of education you have, it, but so, so deep. That after an eternity of an eternity, you will still not be able to grasp the depths of all that is the gospel of Jesus. And another thing, I'm not a dad yet. But one thing I do know is that babies need milk more than once a week. And in the same way, Peter is here saying, like, if, if this is the me uh, metaphor which he is using... We ought to long for the spiritual milk, and babies long for milk often. We are not going to get by in this Christian life. We are not going to do well or thrive in this Christian life if it is simply an hour on a Sunday. You're going to be starving. You're going to be weak. You're going to be feeble spiritually. If all Christianity is, of all your religious practice, is one hour on a Sunday, or this morning, 30 minutes on YouTube. You need more. And that is why we have been brought into community. We have been born, we have been birthed into this new community, this new life. Where the gospel ought to saturate it. As we have said, the gospel is not only the center, but it ought to saturate our life as Christians. We need to talk about it. We need to live out it. We have to live in line with it. And we need to cherish it in daily life. And that's the thing. The church is not a place that you come on a Sunday where one person feeds everyone sitting there with some milk. You go away and you come back the next week to be fed again. No. You are born into a community which where we ought to be mutually feeding one another with the gospel day by day. Day in, day out, week in, week out. The pastor's job is not only, it, it is not solely the pastor's job to feed everyone in the congregation and then they go their separate ways and come back again. The pastor is not a nursemaid to a bunch of children. But we are all to mutually care for one another, minister the gospel to one another, remind one another of the gospel. When, uh, when one falls into sin, that the other remind him of the grace of Jesus. It ought to be part of our everyday lives. 
It ought to be something you can talk about while washing the dishes. It ought to be something that comes up in conversation when you are watching the news. You ought to view everything in life through the lens of the gospel. So in summary, you have been brought into this new community. You have been made pure by obedience to the gospel, which is falling on Jesus, that he is your only hope. And you've been brought into this community, you've been purified because of your faith in Christ and coming to the end of yourself and realizing it is all Jesus. Next, the community is to be a place where we love one another well. We have been made pure to love one another with a brotherly love. We ought to be like a family to one another. Next, our community ought to be founded and built on the gospel. Because if we build it on anything else, it will wither, it will fade, and it will fail. Finally, the gospel ought to saturate our lives. It, not ought, it ought not to be something that you get once on a Sunday, once a week on a Sunday. But it ought to saturate your thinking, your reading, your conversations, your life. Because it is what will sustain you to the end. It is the gospel that changes our hearts from stone. And when I say the gospel, it is the gospel empowered by God. That is what changes the heart. It is the gospel which will sustain you to the end. It is only through daily being reminded of the grace of Jesus that you will be able to run this race to the end. And the gospel is the good news. It is our hope for the future. That through what Jesus has done, this is not all that we have, this life. But those whom we love, we will see again. That the needs, the longings that we have in this life will ultimately be satisfied when we are united to the God whom we were made for. So may we taste and see that the Lord is good daily. May we be reminded of the gospel daily. And then every time that we are reminded, we may taste and see that the Lord is good. And look forward to the day when the taste that we have had may be fulfilled in the full banquet, as it can be said. That we will no longer have a taste, but we will have all that it means to be united to our God. May this hope sustain you. Day by day, week by week, month by month, until you see our Lord in glory. Amen.